Okay, uh, here uh, Philip, so to everyone who will be uh, defense, PhD defense <coughs> at Skopje. So the candidate is Vishwanath Anakshai, supervised by Professor Jacob D. Walter, and the Doctor of Program is Computational Data Science and Engineering. So can you, okay. So let me uh, briefly say about the procedure. So we will, I will first very briefly introduce the jury and the candidate. Then we will have around 40 minutes of presentation of the candidate, plus minus. Then we will have the question from the jury, so I'll ask every member of the jury to ask the questions, make some comments. And well, the formal part is that please uh, say whether you are satisfied or not with the changes introduced to the thesis after the end. Then formally we have the part question from general audience in Zoom, if anyone from Zoom, whatever system we are using right now. Then we typically have a word of the supervisor, or the object who will join us as well. Uh, after that, we move to the breakout room and uh, vote and then announce the decision. So um, I'll try to make it so. Not, not too long, but also not too fast, because this is an important event for the candidate to So, So, uh, introduction of uh, Julia, so the order is more or less arbitrary. So, my name is Ivan Asilidis, I am the chair, so I, I have uh, two, two degrees, candidate of sciences and doctor of sciences, both in medical mathematics. Now I work on tensor decomposition of machine learning and development of neural algorithms, and I'm the director of the Center for Artificial Intelligence Technology at Sculptic and Professor Scott. Okay, next slide, please. Can we switch that? Yes, yes. So the next you remember is Dr. Evgeny Kitenko, who is here, just right to me. So he, is, uh, he works at Russian Quantum Center. So he received his doctorate in theoretical physics from Liberty Physical Institute of Russian Academy of Sciences. And he focuses on the role of, of entropic asymmetry in biparticle quantum uh, states, and he's the leading researcher in the group quantum information technology in Russian quantum center. So clearly, his research interests are directly related and connected to the research related the interest of the topical thesis. Next slide. So next we have our international uh, jury member, which we are always happy to have. So Professor Tim Burns, he's an associate professor of physics in, at MyU Shanghai. He holds a PhD from the University of New South Wales at Sydney, Australia, and he is also an associate director of the NYU ECNU Institute of Physics, also a copy for the Center for Quantum and Topological System at NYU Abu Dhabi. And his research interest in quantum information technologies, and that's quantum physics and atom molecular physics. So, next, please. So, uh, the next nice remember also here, offline with us, uh, Vladimir Palulin, Professor of Sculpting, he graduated from Moscow State University 2007, PhD degree in 2010 as well. Then he worked in Munich and Potsdam in Germany. And after that, he before that he, he went to Cambridge and then he, he moved to Skolte. So he made it, he's now the uh, leader of the Deep Quantum Laboratory, one founded by uh, Professor Jacob Niwonte, and he works on application of machine learning to physics and quantum algorithms. So the next, uh, well, the final jury member is. Professor Jolton Jaboras from Vigna Research Center for Physics, and he is the quantum information scientist working on structural aspects of quantum computing, quantum control, and mechanical theory. So he obtained his PhD at the uh, Atlas, in, sorry if I pronounced it wrong, in the University of Budapest, later worked in Tarina, University of College London, Fire University of Berlin before, before returning to Hungary, and he was selected one of the emerging talents by Journal of Physics A. And he's also the member of several reputable journals, like Journals of Physics, uh, Plus One, Frontiers of Quantum Computer, and also the member of Board of the Key World. So, Professor Jacob Limonta. So, well, he is the advisor. He worked at, at, uh, the, uh, as a quantum application developer at D-Wave in Vancouver, Canada, 
and then later as well uh, Harvard University in the Aspur Uze Group. He obtained his PhD from the University of Oxford in 2010. He worked uh, with uh, John Carlos Bias as part of the Oxford Singapore postdoctoral program, and then he joined uh, the Institute for Scientific Entertainment in 2017. He joined the school tech, worked there as associate professor, head of the lab, later full professor. He also was honored by the user medal laureate and formal scientist. And last year he moved to Duke Dog Foundation chair in Minnesota in Chamber. The last but not the least is our PhD candidate. So he is currently working as a junior research scientist in laboratory of quantum information processing. It's called yeah, the National Quantum Center. Yeah, then it's deep quantum laboratory. The, <laughs> the name is a little bit different. Well, he's working in research science in Skolte. He has 2018 Bachelor of Science, Master of Science of in Photonics, and coaching is the University of Science and Technology of India. He got the uh, award of C.V. Raman for his thesis. And then he was a visiting researcher at the Center for Quantum Technologies uh, in NUS Singapore. And well, then he became the PhD student at School Tech, and I'm really happy to have such strong international PhD candidates. And his research interest, we will of course hear about them when he talks about his results in his thesis. So, Akshay, please, the time is yours 40 minutes, please. Yeah, just a second. I will, okay, just a second, I will meet him. Yeah, well. That doesn't prevent uh, from starting. So, Akshay, please share your, your presentation. Yeah, you, 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 you have to come share it first. Um, mm -hmm. And probably make it larger. There is a button somewhere. This one, and also you can increase the size. Okay, you just look at the right. You see? Right. Ah, I think that, yeah. Uh, okay. Don't want to see the rest. So, yeah, and then it's better. You can do it like that. Okay. That is fine. Is this okay? Yeah, it's okay. perfectly fine. Okay. Uh, thank you for the introduction and uh, the respected jury members and all of those who are attending online and offline. Again, uh, my name is Akshay Vishwanathan, and today I will be defending my thesis titled On Performance of Quantum Approximate Optimization. Okay, so before I move on to listing the main statements that are there in my thesis, let me first establish some context. So we focus on the ground state model of computation, where computation can essentially be thought of as finding ground states of some suitable hardware. Now, the means by which we prepare or find these ground states on a quantum computer is via variation of quantum algorithms. And these are modern algorithms which exploit a hybrid architecture of an intermediate scale quantum device and a classical coprocessor to perform Hamiltonian minimization and therefore computation. Now, specific to combinatorial optimization, one of the most prominent variational approaches uh, that is known is the quantum approximate optimization algorithm. And the main objective of my thesis is to study the algorithmic features of QAOA. Now, with this, in my thesis, I have three formal statements that I have listed in the slide. Let's go through them one by one. Statement number one. The ratio of problem instances constraints to variables, called problem density, induces underparameterization in fixed depth QAV. This effect is termed as HPT deficits. The second statement is regarding optimal parameters for fixed depth QAV, the admit concentrations. So given a set of optimal parameters for n qubits, a set of optimal parameters for n plus 1 qubits can be found within a distance specified by an n plus polynomial. And finally, the circuit depth required for QBAV to recover epsilon tolerant performance on random instances of uh, maximum two such stability can empirically be described by a logistic function on, on, on problem density. So today, in my talk, I will be defending on all three statements. And before, uh, uh, before getting into those, 
let's establish some background and basics. So we work with qubit quantum mechanics, where states are represented by unit vectors psi in the complex vector space C condenser N. For the choice of bases, we use the standard computational basis, and for a single qubit, it is given by these two all vectors, get zero and get one. Uh, the basis for n qubits is obtained by the tensor product of individual qubit bases, and typically they are indexed by bit string scale. We will also invoke the standard notion of an inner product as defined in equation one. And the kind of operations that we perform on qubits are prescribed by linear maps, denoted as L of H, where H is the Hilbert space acting on H, uh, Hilbert space for in qubits. Now specifically, we will consider Hermitian operators and unitary operators. An operator H is Hermitian when H conjugate transpose is equal to H, and an operator U is unitary when U conjugate transpose gives its inverse. Now an important point to note here is the space of Hermitian operator, Operators, denoted here as term C to the N, can be thought of as being spanned by polystrings. Now, what are polystrings? Polystrings are N long strings of polymatrices which are tensored together. They form a basis for linear operators on uh, linear operators for activities. However, since we want the space to be Hermitian, we restrict the span to be over tails. Now, another important notion is the propagator of H, which gives a parameterized unitary U of theta given by e to the minus i theta h for some real theta. Now, since we are interested in combinatorial optimization problems, let us first start with the notion of uh, what is an NP decision problem. So to do this, I represent problem instances by pseudo-Boolean functions f, which map n long Boolean strings to the natural numbers inclusive of zero. Now, since we want these pseudo-Boolean functions to represent instances of NP problems, we will demand that for all inputs y, f of y can be evaluated efficiently. And by efficiency, I mean that the number of steps it takes to evaluate the function f given an input y is upper bounded by some polynomial in n. Now the task of an NP decision problem is to determine the promise. The promise that a given instance is a yes instance, in which case we mean that there is an input y for which f of y is zero, or else it's a no instance, in which case for all inputs y, f of y is greater than or equal to 1. Now there is a natural extension to these decision problems, which are the optimization variants. Here, instead of determining the promise, we seek to determine inputs y star, for which f attains the minimum. Sometimes equivalently, it is stated as finding the minimum of f. Okay. Now let us consider how optimization problems, as I described before, can be viewed as Hamiltonian minimization. To do this, we first map logical bits to qubits. So uh, the Cartesian problem and uh, using the following two maps shown in equation six. Under this map, the pseudo boolean function induces an operator HF, which belongs to the set of diagonal matrices of dimension two to the n. Here, the H, the diagonal values of this Hamiltonian HF correspond to the function values at the input one. Now we can directly see that optimizing uh, Optimization problems stated in terms of minimizing f is equivalent to minimizing the expected value of hf with respect to states from the Hilbert space. Now, let us go through some of the optimization problems that I have uh, addressed or studied in the thesis. We start with Boolean satisfiability. Now, in its decision variant, Boolean satisfiability or SAT is a problem of determining satisfiability or truth value of random Boolean formula. When limited to k variables or literals per clause cost, and expressed in the conjunctive normal form, k sat was proven to be incomplete for k greater than or equal to 3. Now it is easier to understand this in terms of an example, so I draw your attention to equation 9 on this slide. Here we have a, uh, we have a Boolean formula composed of 5 variables and 2 clauses. A k sat instance, uh, a k sat clause constitutes a disjunction of k literals. And here, since we are looking at three such instances, all the clauses in this formula are three literal long. The problem of such probability is to determine whether this formula can be made true or not. And we see that for the, follow, uh, for the specific set of variable assignments shown over here, f of x is indeed equal to one, meaning that the formula is satisfied. 
Now, the optimization variant of uh, decision satisfiability is called maximum satisfiability. And it is the canonical in the heart optimization problem for k greater than or equal to 2. Here, instead of determining whether the formula can be satisfied or not, we seek variable assignments that can maximize the number of boxes in a given instance. And it can be shown that solving max 2 sat is equivalent to minimizing Hamiltonian as shown in equation 10. Here, zj is the poly zj z matrix acting on the jth qubit. And of course, we have appropriate choice. Of, uh, it is valid in the sense that for appropriate choice of coefficients, hj and gj. Now, we will also be interested in uh, optimization problems on graphs. So, given some graph g with a set of vertices v and edges e, uh, a famous optimization problem on graphs is called max cut. Here, the problem is to partition nodes into two complementary subsets, say s and s prime. And we want partition to be in such a way that the number of edges between these two subsets is maximized. Again, it can be shown that solving max cut is equivalent to minimizing a Hamiltonian as shown in equation 10. We can also look at generalizations of this uh, problem, which is now called weighted max cut, by introducing some edge weights to the graphs. And in this case, the Hamiltonian is modified as shown in equation 12. So all of these were examples of a combinatorial optimization problem, which are interesting for computer scientists. But they are also interesting for physicists in terms of the connection to Hamiltonians of a physical system called spin classes. Now what are spin classes? These are systems composed of Ising spins that are arranged in a d-dimensional lattice. And spins can interact with each other using ferromagnetic or uh, anti-ferromagnetic couples. Such classical systems are described by the following Hamiltonian, as shown in equation 13. And if you recall, the forms of the Hamiltonian that we studied before, for example, max sat and max cut, they are specific cases of spin class Hamiltonians under the spin transformations of spins to binary variables. Now, why are spin classes interesting for this is because these systems are known to exhibit uh, phase transitions going from order phase to uh, frustrated low energy configuration when the temperature is lower, uh, is low. And such kind of critical behavior is also observed in the case of combinatorial optimization problems. For example, in case in studying random Boolean formulas, you will have the critical phenomena of satisfiability. And when considering when considering random graphs, you have the birth of a giant problem in the graph. So they are related. So solving such or minimizing such Hamiltonians is not just important in the viewpoint of computer scientists, but also it is it is interesting in terms of physics. And as I mentioned before, the way how we proceed in terms of minimizing such Hamiltonians is by a variation of quantum algorithms. So given some problem Hamiltonian edge, a variational algorithm recovers a ground state approximation of edge. Now how is this done? So we are given an access to a quantum device that can prepare a certain set of variational states or ansatz. They are prepared by applying tunable gates acting on some initial state. Here, uh, I choose zero to be the initial state. For an initial configuration or initial setting for SRT parameters, we, we, pre we prepare this unsat state psi of theta and we measure them in a computational basis to recover the expected value of the Hamiltonian that we are trying to minimize. Now, in all the examples I showed you before, these Hamiltonians were just sums of all these strings, and you can evaluate this expected value term by term independently and then sum them up. And since the number of terms in the Hamiltonian is polynomially bounded, this expected, uh, calculating the expected value becomes efficient on a classical computer. Now once we recover the expected value as a function of theta, we employ classical optimization routines that can tune these uh, certain parameters to obtain the optimal parameter theta star which minimizes theta. And if the variational minima is close enough to the true minima of H, we recover the ground state approximation as psi of theta star. Now what we will be interested in today is, uh, is in understanding this variant uh, called quantum approximate optimization. It is a variational algorithm, so the standard procedure is we start by defining what is known as a variational state space, uh, shown here as omega. It can be thought of as the union over all variational states, psi of gamma and theta, that can be prepared on one computer. Specifically for QBAV, psi of gamma and beta have a prescribed structure. They are prepared by applying an alternating sequence of two propagations. 
propagators of H and propagators of H, uh, propagator of H X, acting on the initial superposition state plus. Here, H is the Hamiltonian that should be multiplied, and H X is a so-called mixer Hamiltonian. And the number of times we apply this alternating sequence is what is typically referred to as the QAV test. Again, standard to gradational algorithms, we perform uh, an optimization over the gradational state space to recover an approximation. And since it's an approximation, it is always greater than or equal to the true minimum of H, which one obtains by performing a group for search. And how this optimization is done, we make use of a classical outer loop optimizer that can adjust circuit parameters to find optimal parameters gamma star and beta star. Um, in terms of understanding the performance of the algorithm, we will first have to uh, develop some performance metric. So I choose area approximation, which is formally defined as follows. Given a problem Hamiltonian H, whose ground states we wish to approximate using some P that give you the P, using P that give you away. Error in approximation is given by the difference between the variational optima that we recover by running the algorithm and the true minima of H, which one recovers by performing good for search. So basically, uh, when, this one, when F is equal to zero, Q away exactly recovers the amount states of H. Now sometimes we will also be interested to understand what is the average performance for the algorithm. And by average, I mean average with respect to problem instances. And to do this, we have to introduce an order parameter for instance generation, which is called problem density. And problem density is defined as the ratio of number of variables to, uh, sorry, number of constraints to number of variables in your optimization problem. With this, I think I've established the background and the basics. Now let's just move on to the defense part of the talk. Recall statement number one. The ratio of problem instances constraints to variables, called problem density, induces underparameterization in a fixed activity. This effect is termed as reachability deficits. To understand the statement, we have to go through what are these two terminologies, underparameterization and reachability deficits. And this is what I will be doing now. Underparameterization is an effect that is common for uh, variational algorithms in general. And what it says is that, uh, let's say we are given a quantum device that can prepare variational states of some prescribed depth B, meaning that we have access to a variational state space represented here as omega B. Since we are interested to minimize some problem Hamiltonian H, whenever the error in approximation becomes strictly positive, we say that there is an underparameterization. This implies that our variational state space that's available to us is not expressive enough to recover the ground states of H. In QAOA, underparameterization is seen to be induced by problem density. And that effect is what is specifically known as reachability deficits. So uh, formally stated, given some problem Hamiltonian H of alpha, alpha being the density, on n qubits, let omega represent the variational state space accessible for a beta QAOA. Reachability deficits are then defined as alpha induced under parameterization. This depends on alpha or not? It depends on alpha. Okay. Yeah. And this dependence can be understood in the following manner. Because when we construct the answers, the, uh, in, in the answers construction, the problem Hamiltonian appears implicitly. And therefore, the variational state space that is accessible to us is inherently dependent on alpha. That's the reason why you end up seeing under parameterization induced by density, and thus the effect. Now let us look at cases where we have observed reachability deficits. So here on this slide, I performed some numerical simulations for QAOA on the problem of maximum two satisfiability. Here, each data on the y-axis, I represent area and approximation, and on the x-axis, I represent cost density, which is the problem density for the case of uh, satisfiability. Each point or each point in density corresponds to an average over 300 random instances. And we studied depth 4, 8, and 12 uh, QA circuits. And as you can see from the graph, for instances, for instances with alpha less than 1, low cost densities, QA away is able to exactly recover the ground states of H, indicated by F of alpha being 0. Now, for a fixed depth, as density is increased, the approximations becomes increasingly worse. When we increase the depth, 
you overall getting a better performance. But then again, the strength of worsening approximations with respect to density can still be seen. And uh, it is for these high density instances that we uh, call, uh, it is for these high density such for BT instances that we observe each of the deficits. What is important or what is interesting to note here is the onset of deficits, which corresponds to alpha C equal to 1. It is known that sadness probability problems undergo a phase transition, or two sadness probability problems undergo a computational phase transition uh, at this critical density. And it is interesting to see how reachability deficits are manifested at the at critical density of alpha C equals 1. Next, we also studied the problem of maximum three sadness probability. And again, uh, in this case, we qualitatively observed the same results, meaning that for a positive fixed step circuit, the performance becomes increasingly worse with respect to uh, problem density. And again, for increased depth, we attain, overall, we attain an overall better performance, but the strength of worsening approximations can still be seen. Then we looked at graph instances. In the case of graph instances, here I'm looking at random graph instances using this Erdos linear random graph model of GN. Basically, I fix the number of nodes in the graph, and I vary the number of edges to, uh, to scale graph density, essentially. And in this case, qualitatively, it's the same results that we observed for sadness probability, but the onset of uh, deficits corresponds to the graph density of 0 0.5. And as you can see, uh, uh, 0 0.5, which is important for this uh, problem, because that's the point where graphs appear to have a birth of a giant complex. Them. Now, what would be uh, assumed here, would, one thing that can be assumed here is that the manifestation of reachability deficits could be, uh, because, could be because we are looking at random instances. What happens if we look at specific instances? Can we comment, uh, can we comment whether there are reachability deficits or not? This is the question that I tried to address in, uh, in this simulation over here. So I considered restrictive instances such as three regular graphs and plain arcuate graphs, and compare their performance with random graphs that were generated at approximately the same densities. And in this case, for varying number of qubits, we do not observe any statistically significant performance bias that comes from uh, whether we are looking at specific instances or whether we are looking at random instances. And we conclude that density, albeit it may be a coarse grain, is the salient limiting factor for, for QBA. And with this conclusion, we were able to, uh, we were interested to map out the performance landscape for a fixed depth uh, QA circuit. And that is what is shown in this slide. On the y-axis, uh, I have different problem size, and on the x-axis, I have graphs that were generated, generated at different densities. And as you can see, for the region of high density, high qubit counts, that's where this, uh, fixed depth circuits become limited in terms of region. So this concludes my uh, defense for statement one, but let me just briefly summarize all the, all the results that, that were there. So empirically, we observed that random instances of maximum three sides of probability and maximum two sides of probability, they exhibit reachability deficits. When, when considering graph optimization problems, corresponding to minimizing two localizing model with, with uniform random coupling strong from minus one plus one, they also exhibit reachability deficits. Now, we were also interested to, to show this effect analytically, albeit for a toy model case. And that's what we have. Uh, considering a triangle free D regular graphs, we were able to recover the error in approximation for a level one QAOA as a function of density. And as you can see, this function is monotonous in, dens in density and therefore proves the existence of three GPT deficits, although for a toy model case. Okay, now let's move on to the second statement I have in the thesis. Optimal parameters for fixed depth QAOA admit concentrations. Given a set of optimal parameters for n qubits, a set of optimal parameters for n plus 1 qubits can be found within a distance specified by an inverse polynomial in n. Now, to understand that statement, we have to introduce what is this effect of, or how do we define parameter concentrations. So that is what is done in this slide. Given gamma, that gamma represents some problem class, and let hg represent the corresponding problem Hamiltonians for random instances g of gamma. 
say that we are given a fixed depth QLV circuit and the optimal parameters for n qubits. Parameter concentrations uh, state that there exists a set of optimal parameters for n plus 1 qubits in such a way that the difference between these two sets scales as an inverse polynomial in n. And one of the implications of uh, parameter concentrations is, is the following. If you consider training on a finite fraction of W much less than n qubits and recover optimal parameters, we can recover optimal parameters for n qubits by performing a polynomially restricted training. Now, how does this help in terms of relational algorithms? It helps in the sense that we can somehow reduce the classical cost associated with training parameterized quantum circuits, such as in the case of QBA. That's why this result uh, is important. However, it's just a definition right now. We were able to prove this for the case of variational state preparation. So what is the problem that we studied? We studied the problem of preparing a computational basis state, T. And in terms uh, of a maximization problem, this can be done as maximizing the target state overlap with respect to a candidate state side of theta that can be prepared on a quantum computer. Now this problem can be addressed in the framework of QAOA and for the case of P equals to 1 and 2, we were able to show the existence of parameter concentrations and also we recovered the scaling to be of 1 over n to the, n to the fourth. We also numerically investigated this phenomena of parameter concentrations for higher depths as well. And that was illustrated in this, uh, in this slide. The circle on the left corresponds to optimal gammas that were recovered numerically and circle on the right corresponds to optimal patterns. Each inner circle corresponds to that particular layer in the QAV ansatz. And considering six up to 17 qubits, we were able to recover uh, the optimal parameters. And we observed that there are two sets of optimal parameters due to some symmetry arguments. So gammas tend to approach pi, and beta tend to approach zero. In each of these cases, going from one to five, we were able to observe, uh, or we were able to verify the presence of parameter concentrations, and we recovered the scaling to be the same as what was proven for the case of B equals to 1 and 2, which is all 1 over n to the fourth. So this concludes uh, statement number two. Now let me move on to the final statement. The circuit depth required for QBA to recover epsilon tolerant performance on random max two such instances can empirically be described by a logistic function on problem density. So here I will like to give a brief background on, on what, what it is that we did. So in the statement, in statement one, we observed a limiting feature for fixed at QBA circuits. <coughs> so if we are addressing instances of high density and high qubits, uh, or high problems, uh, large problem sizes, fixed at QBA may not be able to recover good approximations. So what is the required depth that is needed to recover good approximation? A priori, this is not known, and that this is what we are trying to investigate in this in this work. And this is done by introducing what is known as the critical depth for QBOV. So given some fixed tolerance on performance, say epsilon greater than zero, for QBOV on instances characterized by density alpha and probability, critical depth, P star, is defined as the minimum depth for which error in approximation becomes strictly becomes less than epsilon. And based on numerous uh, empirical results that we did and all we observed and also shown in the literature, we conjecture P star to depend on cost density as a logistic function. Another motivation for choosing the, the logistic function is so that we have the saturation value given by P max. And P max would then re represent the worst case resource usage that our algorithm requires. Then, if we know P max, we can study how P max scales with uh, respect to problem sizes. And this is important in terms of addressing the complexity associated with QAV. But again, all of this is still just a conjecture. So we did some uh, numerical studies to test how good the conjecture is. Here, I calculate P star numerically for the case of five up to 15 qubits. And uh, the problem that was chosen was maximum two such as probability. At each density point, I consider an instance and I start with P equals to one qubit away. And I try to solve it. If if the solution does not meet the acceptance criteria, I increment the depth by one, and I reach the minimum depth, or P star. 
Once P star is calculated for that particular instance, we average our instances for that particular density and look at how it scales with, uh, with, with cost density. The dots represent the numerically recovered P star, and the solid lines represent fits to the logistic function. And as we can see, uh, our the logistic function is able to describe this data within a 3 sigma confidence, meaning that at least for this finite range that we studied, the conjecture is more or less uh, accurate in terms of describing the situation. Based on these, uh, based on the logistic function, we were able to study how P scales with respect to number of qubits, and we observed the scaling to be linear in N. Now, this is interesting, of course, for a finite range of 5 up to 15 qubits. It was, uh, we observed this linear scaling. Now this is interesting in the sense uh, that we know that classical algorithms or classical set solvers, which try to find good solutions to, to satisfy the key, they require exponentially scaling resources. However, if our results seem correct and valid in, uh, valid in the general setting of large problem sizes, this seems to point to a confident advantage in the framework of KPMP, although we cannot assert it because it is based on a conjecture. So that's my uh, that's my defense for the last statement. And let me briefly summarize uh, what we have seen today. So we discovered an effect, now called reachability deficits, which places a fundamental limitation on the performance of fixed depth QPMP. We developed a new type of concentration effect for optimal parameters and prove its existence for the case of variational state revolution. And if this result is valid in the general setting, for example, combinatorial optimization problems, the effects can be leveraged to reduce the possible cost in training QBL circuits. And finally, we developed an empirical model to investigate the critical depth needed for QBL to recover epsilon tolerant or near optimal solutions to random instances of maximum two satisfactory. Based on this model, we recovered a linear trend for resource scaling with, uh, with problem size. And if this result is valid in the general scope, our results actually apply. Then it implies potential for quantum advantage within the framework of QBA. And uh, that's it. Uh, all of these results are in the following published works, and this is what based my thesis on. Thank you very much. So now we move according to our plan to the questions from the jury members. So I would like to ask Professor Tim Burns to give his comments, remarks, suggestions to the candidate. Okay, so thank you very much for the very nice talk. Um, Sorry, could I just uh, clarify a, a couple of uh, basic things first, because um, uh, I just want to understand it properly. So in your reach, uh, reachability deficits part, like, um, so when you, you know, the definition of this F is, yeah, right, right, right. So this, can you just show the definition of the F? Yeah. Oh, you mean, Aaron, right, yeah. Okay. So, when you're talking about this, you know, the problem Hamiltonian here, um, it, it, you know, exactly what is the problem Hamiltonian in the sense of, like, is this, like, just a purely diagonal, like, Hamiltonian, or is there some other more complicated Hamiltonian? So here, I mean, Erdin approximation is valid for all variational algorithms. So it may not be diagonal okay, now, now I hear you. Yep. Yeah. And yeah, go ahead. Okay, I see. So, okay, if it's totally diagonal, then, you know, like, uh, you know, I was imagining actually that this Hamiltonian was some, you know, more complicated state, you know, possessing entanglement and things like that. But then if it's some diagonal Hamiltonian, then, I mean, in terms of this parametrization of the variational state, like, I mean, it should be quite simple, right? So, what am, what am I missing here? Uh, okay. Um, well, even if you end up having a diagonal Hamiltonian, where the ground state would just be specified by a bit string, but the ground state space can, can have degeneracy. 
and the solutions are covered by variational algorithms can indeed admit an argument based on the subspace of uh, based on the downstream subspace. Does that answer your question? Okay. Um well, okay, sort of. Um, all right, then. Uh, then, in that case, uh, you know, I, I, maybe I had the wrong picture of uh, basically the results of your work because uh, you know I was thinking this under parameterization is coming from, you know, basically, uh, you know, not having enough parameters to capture the the nature of the of the state, right? So, um, is that is that the wrong picture to have? No, this is this is correct because under parameterization, when I define it over here, I define it for variational algorithms in general. And you, you're right in the sense that if the ground state is uh, highly entangled, your circuit depth will not be enough to prepare these ground states, and therefore you might end up getting another parameterization. What is specific is region between deficits in the case of QA weight, where under parameterization we observe them to be dependent on density, or we say that they are induced by density. So it's it, you're correct. I mean, uh, I just okay. state under parameterization in the general setting. I see. Okay, and then uh, sort of my more general question was like, so in the QAOA, you know, you have this sort of sequence of uh, the the gates, right? Um, and I mean, QAOA is sort of related to sort of adiabatic quantum computing and um, you know, in that case, the errors sort of come from adiabatic excitations. Uh, in this case, you know, is there any sort of more physical way to understand the, I guess, the nature of the errors? Well, in terms of uh, relation of QAOA to adiabatic theorem, what we know is that this the structure of the ansatz is motivated by adiabatic theorem. But in QAOA, we also have a minimization over the circuit parameters that is done by a, by a classical routine. So QAOA need not follow an adiabatic protocol. And therefore, we, and the, actually, there have been even reports in the literature that says that there are certain kinds of problems for which a QAOA outperforms any adiabatic algorithm. Mm -hmm. and, sure, yeah. and therefore, I, I do not directly compare QAOA as being some approximate adiabatic algorithm. And I, I typically say that it can recover any adiabatic algorithm, but it can probably perform better because of this optimization routine that we have. Okay, all right. Thanks for your answers. Thank you for the questions. Yeah, so thank you, Jim. So, what? Okay, so next again, I will ask, ask our international jury member, Dr. Zoltan Chuboros, to give his feedback and questions. Okay. Yes, so. <clears throat> Uh, th thanks a lot for this presentation. This, it was excellent, both. Uh, I have some uh, general questions. I understand that uh, you had you you looked for what type of problems can be can QAOA solve in shallow depth? Like what are the fundamental limitations of QAOA? It says what are the like the reachability deficits, and then you whether there is. Um, some features of the optimal meters that stays the same for many types of problems like this meter concentration and then you had also described this empirical description of how many QAOA levels you should choose to guarantee the performance of QAOA. So I have two questions around all the three topics. One natural question is that this is like for QAOA which is in some sense one of the simplest variational quantum algorithms. Could some of this be transferred? Would it be easy to study those questions for VQEs or so variational quantum eigen solvers or, or perhaps even quantum machine learning type of questions? So, to be more specific, obviously, the, when you talk about, let's say, parameter concentration, then be that would be a set of molecules or a type of set of Hamiltonians that would be in some sense close to each other. And, but the other questions also make sense. So what, what is your 
what would you say about this? Would this be easy to transfer? Do you think any of these is transferable or I mean transferable in the sense that you could investigate perhaps these questions or what are, what is your feeling about this? Thank you very much for the question. Okay. Um, in terms of uh, understanding mutual between deficits, as you mentioned, QAOA is a very simplistic setting where you have the problem Hamiltonian and you have a drive, uh, a mix of Hamiltonian, and then you alternate them to, uh, in terms of their properties. Now, to make it more VQE like, what you would have to do is make the answers problem Hamiltonian agnostic or sort of agnostic in the sense that you don't supply the Hamiltonian into the answers construction. Such works have been done before. And I would expect uh, reachability deficits or some some criteria of deficits to carry forward in the, in such cases as well. So that is regarding deficits. In terms of uh, parameter concentrations, this would be interesting. Okay, our motivation for parameter concentration comes from this result from Farhi when he studied Sherrington Kirkpatrick model. And he showed that instances of Sherrington Kirkpatrick model, they end up concentrating in the thermal dynamic limit. So essentially, you get rid of the problem, uh, you get rid of the structure of the problem, essentially. And uh, in those limits, I would say variational algorithms may end up showing such, such features of uh, concentrations in their optimal parameters recovered as well. So that's how I would address the, the notion of parameter concentrations. And in terms of uh, the last one here, yeah, last one I don't have a comment on because this was specifically done uh, in the case of standard QAOA. Okay, so thanks for these nice answers. So I have a couple of further questions, I mean, also related to these points. So one is that, uh, so could you imagine or have you thought about the following thing that there would be a, a uh, let's say some type of uh, parameter in 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 your problem set? I mean, for example, you took Erdős Rényi graphs. There are some parameters that characterizes the Erdős Rényi graph, but you could have also taken other graph families or other problems. You could have taken the traveling salesperson problem. And, and then there are these parameters characterizing. And could you imagine that for certain parameter regions, there is a concentration in one region in, in some, for other parameter regions in some other, and that could be like, let's say a type of phase transition, uh, depending on this type of thing, like, or have you investigated this, that like, like different type of parameter regions have different uh, uh, concentration, points, let's say, for the parameters. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I mean, that's an open-ended question, so I maybe you know something about this, or your results show something around this, or maybe you say that for the adder it doesn't matter which parameter I take. Well, typically, when I, when I was studying this, uh, or when I was trying to assess or investigate more, investigate more into each of the deficits, oh, sorry, uh, this is regarding parameter concentrations, is it? Or could you repeat the question again, Tolton, please? Yes, yes. So my, my question was the following. So it, it, it was just an open-ended question, uh, more like for curiosity when you talked. So, I mean, parameter concentration means, I mean, uh, that basically parameter space, when you choose the optimal values, for a set of, let's say, an ensemble of problems, then they have some typical points where, or, or regions where the optimal parameters are. And also you have typical regions where the, where the really bad parameters are. If you put in, then your uh, energy is very high or your energy is very low if, 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 you are, if you are on the optimal, right? Do I understand this correctly, sort of? Yes, that is correct. Yeah, so could you imagine that, um, that uh, you could you could change the parameters of an ensemble. So for each parameter, you would have an ensemble. Let's say you know for Erdős Rényi graphs, you know you have a sort of like a connectivity parameter. I mean, I, I'm not sure if it was for Erdős Rényi. It was just an example, like 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 
they are all dense graphs, but you can you can you can actually tune the density of the graph of the Erdős-Rényi graphs. And you could imagine perhaps, and maybe let's ask it concretely for the Erdős-Rényi, that when you are tuning the uh, density of the of these uh, ensembles, you would have maybe the parameter concentration would move, or maybe it wouldn't move, but abruptly change for some types of graphs. Or have you observed anything, or would you believe that there could be such a thing at all? Okay, now, now I understand the question. <laughs> sorry, I blanked out there. <laughs> no, sorry for this, it was unclear. Okay. okay, so one result that I am actually aware of, which studies these uh, behavior or distributions of, of optimal parameters, mm -hmm. And this was done for the case of three regular graphs. Mm -hmm. By studying three regular graphs, what the authors uh, there observed was that optimal parameters, they are not just random. They follow some sort of a distribution with respect to instances. And when your system, uh -huh. size, when your system size increases, these distributions tend to move. I they see. Yeah. I they see. tend to be better and they tend to move. I, see. I, I, I did not rigorously study this, although I, I, I saw certain mm -hmm. behaviors of this in my numerics as well, but I did not go into deep in terms of investigating this effect. But going to, Thanks. This, question of phase, yeah, going to this question of phase transition, what I would expect is the following to, to happen. You mm -hmm. have like one ensemble of three regular graphs, and let's say you have a continuous order parameter that changes the structure of the graphs going from three regular to, let's say, um, some other type of uh, configuration. Here, uh -huh. I would expect that based on these two ensembles, there will be a different distributions and there will be a transition for optimal parameters moving and uh, as you change the sort of parameters from one specific instance to uh, one specific ensemble to the other. This is what I would expect. But I I um, I have not investigated this in a rigorous manner. Right, and then sorry for asking so many questions, but I'm just interested in the topic. So you, you mentioned in your thesis a couple of times noise. In particular, of course, noise is important for studying shallow depth circuits that you have done very nicely because then there is less noise. But uh, what do you think that? Uh, would any of your conclusions change if you would add uh, noise into the system or would some of them remain or this has to be investigated what what is the how would the effect of noise <clears throat> that's a gate noise uh, I mean, to play. so so one result that i am aware of is that typically noises are specified in terms of these gate noise probabilities and it is mm -hmm. uh, the different or the variations in the recovered energies scale linearly, linearly with the state noise probabilities. This was shown mm -hmm. in the variation. Systems. So when it goes for reachability deficits, I would still expect reachability deficits there, because even with, with noise, I mean, you would shift the expected energy, but then you would sure. not be able to shift far enough to reach the ground state. So right. That is regarding, that is regarding um, reachability deficits. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the case of concentrations, I would not. No, I don't have an answer for that yet. I have to investigate. Yeah. Okay, yeah. That, that's very interesting. Thanks a lot for all the great Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Zoltan, yeah, for quite a lot of questions. So we move on. Dr. Evgeny Kitev. Actually, I have two questions. Uh, probably the first one you somehow already uh, answered. It's also, it was a kind of a general question, but I, I'm also curious. So uh, you called uh, you told us uh, about this concentration uh, concentration effects uh, with respect to this uh, state preparation problem. It's really really nice, and uh, I just wondered uh, if you uh, if you uh, 
met the similar the similar effects in your other of your of your studies of QOE, for these two sets problems, three sets problems, and so on. Just just maybe you, you met it or or or, the, or particular or you know, the behavior of these optimal parameters uh, that does not uh, does not have this has this effect at all. Maybe but uh, anyway and uh, so. And, uh, so as far as I understand, you didn't uh, you didn't study it in detail, but, but I, anyway, I, I'm very interested in whether you you met this, this kind of effects. And uh, my my second uh, question uh, would also be very interesting. So uh, in your third part, uh, you showed us very this very nice plot uh, of dependence of dependence of this critical value of um, uh, yeah, of, of this of the survey number of these uh, this layers for dependence uh, with the growing of qubits. And uh, I wonder, so okay, so this is, uh, so this is um, the number of layers, uh, uh, but I wonder, so there is one, one more difficulty which you understand, is the difficulty of solving, of particular solving this optimization problem, uh, because there may be a good solution, but however, to get the solution, it may, may be hard, because of this, very local, this local minimus, or this, uh, this landscape, or this problem, it's also, it's also becomes complicated. And uh, so, as far as I understand, you used, you used a lot of numerics uh, here in your study, and I wonder, uh, do, do you see uh, the increasing of complexity of solving this problem with, with increasing of these uh, Pmax during, during your simulations? For example, you need more more runs of your optimization routine in order to, to obtain point or all this, this optimization complexity remains the same? That's actually a very nice question. So uh, yes, it is uh, when we were trying to obtain the max or when we were trying to do the merits, one of the challenges that we faced is exactly in this optimization part because typically these landscapes are highly not complex and there are multiple local minimums. And if you use optimizers that are based on random initializations, you pick a random initialization for your optimizer or for your circuit parameters, then you try to search for a minimum. You will need a lot of runs to get a very good solution. This is the reason why we devised a heuristic optimization strategy, which is based off of layer-wise training. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you want more details, I can give you more, but like, in terms of what we have is the following. So there are, these are two like optimization strategies. One is the random initialization that I mentioned before, and the other one is the layer-wise heuristic that we use in minimizing uh, instances. And as you can see, uh, this is like 50 attempts. So I pick an instance and I run the optimizer 50 times. For random initialization, the spread is quite big, but whereas when we use this heuristic layer-wise strategy, the spread is small, and more or less with increasing depth, it basically becomes, I mean, it basically becomes zero. So, what I can say based on this, I, I, I cannot conclusively answer that we are indeed at the global optimum, just based on this plot. Mm -hmm. But what I can say is the fact that uh, you need far less attempts of running the layer-wise heuristic strategy than when compared to random initializations where you have to keep, keep iterating the, all over the same instance to recover good optimum. And what, what was the problem for this particular? Here I took some random instance of a three regular graph with ten, yeah, with ten nodes. Also with minus one plus one. Mm -hmm. I see. It's very interesting. Super. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for the question. Yeah, that's all. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, Eugenie. So, Doctor Vladimir Professor. Vladimir <laughs> Professor. Yeah. Thank you very much for this very nice presentation. So, judging by the title of your PhD thesis, you talk about performance. However, once we start thinking about real physical systems, all the realizations of quantum computer we know of do have noises. So, obviously, uh, noise is important. However, you somehow omit this question. I mean, you have a theoretical work, it's perfectly Fine, but could you uh, first say what types of noises will affect the performance of the algorithms you considered and corresponding, let's say, to different realizations of quantum computers? 
Okay, so uh, as you mentioned, I mean, like, I did not study mice in this work, and the kind of like one result on mice that I know of is that when you consider stochastic mice, for example, where the gate works ideally with a certain probability and uh, with one minus b, it has some errors. For such kind of mice models, there was a reason for it from our group, which says that uh, the, the perturbation from the ideal case will be bound by uh, the range of, uh, of values that you can perturb it, perturb the gate with. So, in the range, you mean amplitude of the noise? Yeah, but here you would perturb the gate with respect to some theta that is like drawn from a range. And the size of the range is what dictates uh, how much perturbation you will end up getting in, in recovering the ground state or not. So, this is what I know of. And uh, it, is also it is also shown in the literature that these two models, stochastic models, can be related to the quantum devices that appear in terms of channels that you apply. That's, that's basically how much I know regarding noise, but in terms of real physical implementations, I mean, don't have much information. Okay, so do you think whether the noise could change the scalings which you obtained in chapter 5? For a low amount of noise, actually, it would be interesting to repeat all of these studies in its entirety because the behavior of classical algorithms is you have this optimizing routine that is there. Sometimes what can be done is, let's say your Hamiltonian has certain symmetry protection in its ground states, and therefore because of this, you might not be able to recover, or you might not, you might require a larger depth of your answers to it to minimize the Hamiltonian. What noise could do in this case is that it could break the symmetry. And therefore, you would expect the minimization to be done uh, faster, or you would converge more faster to the ground states. There are a lot of such open questions regarding noise. And uh, yeah, it, it would be interesting to repeat all of these studies in the presence of noise. But in terms of scalings, I, I don't have a, a rigorous answer for that, unfortunately. Okay, yeah, basically, these were one questions. A lot of questions have been uh, answered, so can you show uh, slide number 18? So, yes, you have these plots, and basically you solve numerically the minimization problem. Well, a similar question has been asked, but still, so how you can be sure that you find global network here? And the second, how many samples do you use for working this? Uh, mm -hmm. So, uh, again, uh, based, I, I cannot conclusively say that we are at the global minima or not, but what we did, uh, at least numerically, is to develop certain techniques to better converge to the global minima, or avoid many of the local minima. That's, that's what we asked. Yeah, so, this is a, like up and yeah. down. You're saying, yes. You hope that this is a lower bound, but maybe there is a better. There are better parameters if you want, but nobody knows you have to do that. And in terms of averages over here, I am considering 300 instances uh, for each point. 300 instances for each point, okay. Okay. Um, uh, another, another question. So, when, it, when people talk about like, this larger quantum computers, uh, which has 400, I don't know what to about, there is a D wave, which is not. Quantum, but there is this IBM chip which is 400 qubits on a So, this uh, graph type problems and uh, quantum QAOA is one of the main flagship papers. I think we will be able for that, not, not so much data, we will be able to solve very complicated graph card problems efficiently. So, thus, your research means that it is not true. That's because you, this, this is the, to my understanding, because all of the circuits they have very few number of parameters, and if you say, okay, it's just a random graph, and you want to do more scat, it won't work, right? Yeah, with, with at least uh, QBA uh, in the standard setting, without yeah, changing. That's for random graphs. If you, for example, take, you know, there are some standard, there are several benchmarks where people test quantum quant quant logarithms, you mm -hmm. right? More. So does it also map to the real hardware, or to the to sort of to some particular realizations, or maybe random 
it's like when you take I don't know matrix, you take a random matrix, it's dense and uh, orthogonal. And if you take but in practice, the matrix is typically sparse and very ill conditioned. So the, the distribution of real may, may be different from just random. Like random is the worst possible case. Okay. Um, yeah, this is a this is a valid question, and that's that's one of the reasons why I wanted to study different graph structures. Also motivated from the connectivity that we can realize on current quantum hardware. So we took like these restrictive instances or specific instances, which are not statistically uh, random instances. Okay. Yeah. They don't constitute random instances. Mm -hmm. And then we when we compare the performance with respect to random instances that were generated at approximately the same densities, we we are basically within one standard deviation of each other. Okay. Yeah. So you, you should have here quantum graph, you have three layer graph. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are among all the graphs that might be interested for some future research. There, uh, you can actually look at the Connectivity of the graphs, so some, some things called, for example, I recently read about Ramanujan graphs and properties, maybe looking into those uh, graphs, maybe give you some different dependencies. So it happens, for example, well, it, well for example, just about this is an association that the neural networks, you have this so called logic teacher hypothesis that you need to have a dense layer, and you can, there are always a subset of entries which corresponds to some sparse. Interaction with the neurons that gives much better accuracy than just the original one. When people study what type of connectivity we need to use in order, what, what, basically, what is the property of the graph that gives you the possibility that we get better accuracy? So, if you come up with a certain family, parametric family of the graphs, and then relate this parametric family of the graph to the property of example, how good you can solve max start with quantum or without quantum, I think maybe you can find something there, but okay, this is purely related. Okay. Okay. I mean, also there are these scale free graphs, which are not considered here, which yeah, have so, applications. Yeah, yeah, because, well, the, 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 it seems to me that a lot of uh, investment has been done into the building machines, and one of the flagship applications is uh, graph Things, and this work basically says that for random graphs it doesn't give you um, some significant. Okay, uh, I also have another question. So, in your part where the parameter concentration, you estimate the concentration in terms of the differences between parameters, right? Yeah. But well, what you actually need, you need the difference not between parameters, but between the actual well, states that you have present. Can you use it to bound? Well, what is the sensitivity basically of the state with respect to the parameters? This this is a good question because I mean you could also here we consider fixed depth. So for this fixed depth, it, it is not necessary that the state that I'm preparing is actually uh, close to what the quantum computer gives me. But still, there is an optimum, and yeah, it is based yeah, on. Yes, I, I, I mean maybe you have this gamma n beta n plus one, mm -hmm. which are close. But for example, the function is different because well, maybe the gradient with respect to you, those parameters is quite small, quite large, for example. But these these indeed compare distance metrics uh, of two vectors. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Well, but you can make a small perturbation to the parameters and it will give you give you large difference in the Okay, that's I think all. I don't have any. I am satisfied with the revision. Okay, so that concludes the questions from the uh, jury members. So now we have questions from the audience. Do you have any? Yes, we do. Any? You can see it on the screen. So Akshay, if you can see it as well. So there is okay. The question, the question by Shrifa. I can I will read it. Be able to see. So, thank you for that awesome presentation. Can you please comment on the forum? First question Do you have an intuition 
why there is a concentration of parameters. The concentration results study on QAOA used to prepare the target state using projection of parameters as the, as the cost of movement, not the usual using computer. 2A. Is this used as a toy model as if one already knows what the projector is? Then would one need to, to do QAOA to prepare this thing? And to be, do you know if there are any concentration results also applied to using formulation of optimization program? Um, yeah. Yeah, so there are two questions, and the second question has two subparts. Okay, so addressing the first questions, is there any intuition for parameter concentration? And uh, as I mentioned before, they, there was the study that uh, Parky did where he was looking at instances of sharing the Carbatric model. And in the thermodynamic result, in the, in the thermodynamic limit, he observed that uh, basically the expectation values for QA arrays converge irrespective of instances, or basically the choice of minus one plus one for, for your graph couplings. I believe this could be one of the reasons why we observe parameter concentrations. If I mean that that would be my guess, although I don't have any rigorous studies that establish that this is the reason why parameter concentrations occur. Now, regarding the second one, is this used as the toy, toy model? This is correct, because in terms of proving parameter concentrations, we needed to recover scale of how these optimal parameters uh, differ. And to do this, in the general setting, is quite hard. So we chose a, a projector case where we can analytically solve, solve for the overlap function, and then look at the optimal parameters using standard techniques. So that's the reason why we used uh, the projector. However, in terms of uh, preparing such projectors, it is already known. It is an easy problem. We are not trying to prepare a team uh, to do some computation with it. Instead, we wanted to use a problem that we can analytically solve. That was the motivation. And um, the last one is if there are concentration, if these concentration results also apply to, to the Isaac formulation. Well, part, yes, because there are already works in the literature that talk about parameter concentrations. They don't specifically give the scaling, but what they describe is that there are distributions of optimal parameters, for instances, and how these distributions would become narrower or, become, uh, or they move in the parameter space with respect to system sizes. So I believe the results that we have shown over here is just for one single instance, and there are no other instances in here. But if we extend them to include uh, averaging over instances, then I believe uh, you would be able to see these effects, although I don't think analytical techniques would work here. So that's, that would be my answer to these questions. I hope I, I was able to give you some, some intuition for concentrations, but yeah. Okay, yeah, so there is, we see that there is a thank you in the chat. Well, no more questions, as I see it. So we move according to our schedule. So, Jacob, I guess I do want to have you here. He seems to be. No, no, he's online, but it's about. Ah, okay. My microphone is not supported on this Tech application. Okay, which happens. Yeah, we do have some problems. Anyway, so here you go. So I'll read it. Like, imagine that I'm Jacob. So, <laughs> uh, so this body of research made some impact. It changed the direction of the subject of QAA. The research was complete, the, the, the thesis was well written, and the published results to his papers will become classics. Well, that's not bad for PhD. Well, okay. <laughs> now let's see if he really makes the tenure track assistant professor with it next three years. Okay, that's a big. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> so that we gather in three years and see. I also recommend him for a thesis award on some type of honorable mention by the CDC program or another committee. Okay. Uh, yeah, that was the word of Professor Pimonta. I think very strong words and very strong support. So now, please, everyone who is not the 
member of the committee. You can leave the stuff here. I don't know if this should be the uh, say, say something. Make a note in your name. Yeah, thank you very much. All the jury members, all the participants uh, who attend here and also online. This was a very special moment, a very special day in my life. I always wanted, means I was passionate to do a PhD, and this is the reason why I came to Moscow for it. And today I, I think I achieved that. So it's, it's, a, it's a very nice moment. And I am glad that I'm sharing this moment with all of you, friends, family, everybody alive. And of course, PhD for me at least was not a cakewalk. There were multiple times when um, it was very difficult. And thankfully, I had a very good friend, a good bunch of people who were there to support me professors, friends, work colleagues, and, they, and also friends who are not here in Moscow at all and who are like far away. So, yeah, I would like to, I would like to extend my thanks to all of you. Get with me on this journey. Thank you very much. Ooh.